Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor Study. This TV show is coming to you from the state of Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes and taxes, where fishing is a huge deal. This is my fishing pole. <laughs> and when I was a little boy, I grew up in Nebraska. There aren't many lakes in Nebraska. Dad loved to fish. So in the summers for two weeks, we'd come up to Minnesota and fish, fish, fish. And when, when my brother and I were little, we liked to snoo sneak out into the garage and go through Dad's big tackle box because it had all these colorful lures and everything. Well, this program, we're going to go through our Heavenly Father's tackle box. We're going to look at what lures did Jesus use to get men and women into the boat and to save them? What bait did he fish with? Would you turn with me to Luke chapter 5, and let's learn how to fish for men from Jesus Christ. Let's pray first. Father, we would pray today that you'd use each of us to fish for human beings, that we would have as a, a, just a zeal in our heart that we would bring our loved ones to Christ, our neighbors, our people at work. Lord, teach us now how to fish for humans and open our ears and hearts to your message. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 5, let's learn how Jesus fished. Chapter 5 of Luke, verse 1. Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around Jesus and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Peter's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitudes from the boat. Did you notice from what I just read, what lure, what bait did Jesus get, use to get people to press in? It said, he was speaking the word of God. Here's the first lesson. The bait you use to catch people is the word of God. The people are being attracted by the word of God. Now, somebody said to me, you know, Pastor Tom, people at work do not like me. I'm about the only Christian. They talk about premarital sex and abortion. They're all in favor of that. Now and then I say, but do you know what the Bible says about that? They don't like me, so I think I should maybe just be quiet. And I said, well, isn't it normal for the fish to struggle with the bait? <laughs> and, and Vance Havner said, the fact that the gospel is unpopular is all the more reason to preach it. And I said to him, as long as you are humbly, lovingly sharing what God's word said, keep fishing. <laughs> and even though non-believers struggle with uh, the, the teachings of Scripture, there's also something very attractive to them about the Word of God. I learned this in college. I have a buddy named Dean, and he and I would go out now and then to this Italian restaurant to eat, and we'd get into deep talks about God, and it often happened to see the people at the next booth leaning in and just listening to it. So the, the world will struggle with the bait, but still the Word of God draws people. So my question for you is, <laughs> do you fish with the bait of the Word of God with your family? Susanna Wesley was born in London in 1669. She married a pastor from the Church of England. They had 19 children. And listen to how Susanna Wesley raised her 19 kids. The children were taught the Lord's Prayer as soon as they could speak and repeated it every morning and every night. Psalms were sung every morning 
and every night. In addition, at the beginning and close of every day, the older children would team up with one of the younger children and read the psalm appointed for the day and a chapter in the Bible, after which each child went to their private devotions. In a letter to her husband, Susanna Wesley wrote, I observe the following method. I take such a portion of time as I can spare every night to discourse with each child alone. On Monday, I talk with Molly, on Tuesday with Hetty, Wednesday with Nancy, Thursday with Jackie, Friday Patty, Saturday with Charles, etc. Years later, Susanna Wesley is dying. Her children are around her bed, and here's what one of her children wrote as an adult. I left Bristol and came to London and found my mother on the border of eternity. But she had no doubt or fear nor any desire but to depart and be with Christ. About three in the afternoon, I went to my mother and found her change was near. One hour later, her soul was set at liberty. We stood around the bed and fulfilled her last request, uttered a little before she lost her speech. Children, as soon as I am released, sing a psalm of praise to God. The son who wrote those words was John Wesley, famous uh, revivalist preacher who got on horseback, went all over England for years, converted thousands, and founded the Methodist Church. Another of her children was Charles Wesley, who wrote some of the best hymns in the history of the Christian church. You'd know some of his hymns. But my point is, Susanna Wesley fed her children the word of God, and then her children grew up and fed everybody the Word of God. Mom and Dad, Grandma and Grandpa, let me ask you this question. Do you feed your children the Word of God? Not do you send them to Sunday school and church. Do you feed your children the Word of God? I have a nephew by the name of Ben. And I'm his godfather. And the, the purpose of a godparent is to encourage the child to Christ. But they live in a different state. But, this is years ago now, but Ben's graduating high school. And so I go down to visit them. And he and I are floating on these inflatable mattresses in the middle of the lake getting a suntan. And Uncle Tom thinks, I better do some fishing. And... And Ben was raised in a very liberal church where I don't think they preach salvation. So we're laying there. I said, Ben, can I ask you what you've learned uh, going to church at your church? Sure, Uncle Tom. Well, do you know what the Trinity is? I've never heard that word, Uncle Tom. So, well, Ben, there's one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Ben, do you know how the world's going to end? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I said, well, it's called the second coming of Christ. Jesus returns in the clouds, raises the dead, judges the world, then the earth melts. Uh, didn't know that, Uncle Tom. Ben, do you know where people go when they die? Well, I've wondered that. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I talked about heaven and hell. Finally, Ben, do you know for sure, do you know how to make sure you go to heaven instead of hell? Uh, no. So I share the gospel, Christ died for our sins, rose from the dead, believe in him and you will be saved. But again, I'm, I, if you're a mom or dad or a grandma and grandpa or just a godparent, uncle or aunt, make sure, don't trust the church or the Sunday school class. It's your job, like Susanna Wesley, to regularly talk to your children and grandchildren about Christ. And, and one more thing to say about the bait, the word of God. Keep it simple. You don't need a fancy lure. Some people think, well, yeah, but I don't know enough about the Bible. I haven't been to Bible school, so I'll just be quiet. No, no. Speak, but just be simple about it. Martin Luther said this, When I preach, I regard neither the professors nor the magistrates, of whom I have 40 in my congregation. I have my eyes upon the children and the servant maids. If the learned men are not well pleased, well, the door is always open. <laughs> In other words, keep the bait simple. Just speak the simple word of God. You don't need a fancy lure or a degree. Next verse. We're in Luke chapter 5, starting now at verse 4. 
And when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, put down into the deep water and let your net go for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but at your bidding, I will let down the nets. Here's the next lesson. Obey Jesus even if he doesn't make sense. I mean, Peter's thinking, look, we, f we fished all night over there and got nothing, but if you say so, and, and Peter uh, uh, obeyed. My, my point here is, if you read something in the Bible that doesn't make sense, do it anyway. Because <laughs> we got a mind like this, God's got a mind like this, and if God says something and it doesn't make any sense, do it anyway. And let's see what happened then. Verse 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break, and they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them, and they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. <laughs> Here's the next lesson. Smart people fish where Jesus tells them to fish. Jesus says, go over there, and that's when they got the fish. I mean, uh, have you ever had this experience? You're fishing somewhere and getting nowhere, but you move the boat just a little ways away, and boom, you're catching fish. My point here is only God knows where the fish are, so consult him before you go fishing. I'll give you an example. I like to, in the morning, pray, God, if it's your will, use me to share you with somebody today. And, and then I wait and see. I mean, this week I went garage sailing, and here's a grandpa with his daughter and the two grandkids, and I'm looking at their stuff, and it just seemed right, and I said, excuse me, I'll be right back, I'm gonna give you something. I went to my car, I got um, about five of these uh, little salvation booklets and I handed it to them and I said this changed my life when I was 19 years old and so you know just now I had prayed earlier God use me to I didn't know I was going to share the gospel with them but just um, smart people fish where Jesus says <laughs> to fish do you do that in the morning do you take time to pray I I'll, I'll tell you how this TV show got started 33 years ago, I was a young preacher, and I started one day to say, all right, and actually, I got a piece of paper and a pencil, and I took some time, and I prayed, God, what do you want me to do with my life? What are my gifts? What am I good at? And that's when it came to me, you should get on TV. We started that 33 years ago. We're still doing it. And if you've never done this, I encourage you to do this. Get alone with God, get a piece of paper and a pencil, and write what's called your personal vision statement. And you, you ask God questions like this, or ask yourself, what lights me up? What do I have a burning desire to do? What excites me? What are my gifts? If I could do nothing else with my life, what would I do? In other words, God, specifically with my gifts, where do you want me to fish? And write it down. And then you'd maybe do it every 10 years or whatever. But I will, I, I've taught a lot of 13-year-olds confirmation class. But at the end of each year, I'd sit down alone with each student and I'd ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, a nurse or a technician or something. I said, okay, have you ever asked God, what do you want me to do when I grow up? And I said, you know, God made you. He knows what's going to make you the happiest. So even at age 13, start praying Basically, God, where should I fish? <laughs> Look at verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw that, the miracle of fish, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all the companions because of the catch of fish that they had taken. Here's the next lesson. When God does something awesome, you feel your sinfulness. Peter sees this miracle and he says, get away from me, Jesus. I'm too sinful for you. <laughs> when John Wesley would preach in England in the 1700s on horseback, town to town to town, he'd, he'd preach three times a day. But 
he writes, I, I have his diary, John Wesley's diary, and he writes this in his diary. 1742, June 12. I preach to those assembled on the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of faith. While I was speaking, several dropped down as dead, as among the rest such a cry of, was heard of sinners groaning for the righteousness of faith, that my voice was almost drowned out. But many of those who soon lifted up their voice began with joy, uh, with thanksgiving, being assured they now had the desire of their soul, the forgiveness of sins. I observed a gentleman there who was of no religion and had not been at public worship of any kind for 30 years. Seeing his, him stand motionless like a statue, I asked him abruptly, Sir, are you a sinner? He replied with a deep and broken voice, Sinner enough. And he continued staring upward until his wife and a servant or two, who were all in tears, put him in their carriage and carried him home. I mean, when Wesley would preach, it was kind of awesome, and people would feel their sinfulness. Look at verse 10. And also John and James, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, Peter, and Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. Here's the next lesson. Do not fear, you are too sinful for God. Peter says, I'm too sinful to do this. No, no, no I'm going to use you anyway, Peter. <laughs> Satan's big lie is to tell people, you're too sinful. Who are you to talk to somebody else about Jesus Christ? And let me tell you what I do. When I sin, I say, God, please forgive me. I bounce back up and I keep fishing because there's a whole world of people out there that are going down if they don't find Jesus Christ. So I don't let my sinfulness keep my mouth shut. At least I try not to. Martin Luther had a barber in the 1500s. Martin Luther one day goes to the barber. And the barber says, oh, Dr. Luther, I'm such a sinner. I know I'm going to hell because I've done this and, and all. And Luther heard him out and then finally he said, sir, never be so vain to think that you can out -sin the grace of God. <laughs> Jesus did not let Peter's sinfulness keep him from using Peter. In fact, there's a saying, witnessing is just one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. Let me repeat that. Witnessing, sharing your faith, is just one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. Look at verse 10 again. And Jesus said, do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. Not fish, you'll be catching men. So let me ask a question of everybody, but especially the men, <laughs> especially the men in Minnesota. What is more important to you, fishing for fish or fishing for men? The second weekend of May in Minnesota is fishing opener. Big traffic jam from the Twin Cities to get up to northern Minnesota and fish because it's fishing opener. It's a big deal. But I got to thinking, what would happen if the men of Minnesota valued fishing for men more than fishing for fish? I think I kind of know what would happen. Um, the second weekend of May, the highway would not be jam-packed because men are going to stay home and fish for fish for men right in their house. And so he says, honey, to his wife, how's your relationship with God these days? Are you praying these days? You're reading your Bible? Uh, and then little Susie, little Jimmy, do you know how much Jesus loves you? Can I explain to you what happened on the cross for our salvation? And then he goes outside and there's somebody over, over the, hey, Ed, how are you? Good at time. Have I ever shared with you the most important thing in my life? If men valued fishing for men like we value fishing for fish, it would change the world. Last lesson is verse 11. And when they had brought these boats to land, they left everything and followed Jesus. Here's the last lesson. There's only one thing 
worth leaving everything. There's only one thing that's worth leaving everything. Uh, again, like I say, uh, uh, you read J uh, John Wesley's diary. He's kind of like an energizer bunny in the 1700s. This guy would get on a horse for years and years and ride from town to town throughout England, preaching often, three times a day. In one town, they'd beat him up, and he'd just get up and go to the next town. And you wonder, what made him tick? What, what fired him up like this? I think he knew the, the truth of this verse. There's only one thing worth leaving everything. And I want, to, I want to read now just one paragraph from a John Wesley sermon. Here's how he preached. People, settle it in your heart and let it be ever uppermost in your thoughts that if you are on the wide road, you are on the road that leads to destruction. If many go with you, be sure both they and you are going to hell. The moment a soul drops the body and stands naked before God, it will be eternity, either experiencing joy or everlasting torment. All the torments of hell are without intermission. They have no respite from pain, but the smoke of their torment goes up day and night. No sleep accommodates that darkness, and be their suffering ever so intense, there is no possibility of escape. No, not for a moment. That's the way John Wesley preached, because he knew there's only one thing worth everything. There's only one thing that can get us out of hell into heaven for all eternity, and that got him on his horse day after day after day, going and fishing after as many fish as he could get in the boat. When John Wesley was little, he almost died when he was age five in a house fire. And he called himself after that point a brand plucked from the burning. But when he came to die as an old man, he'd always give his money away. He was very generous. But they, after he died, a writer said this. What did Wesley leave behind? It is estimated that John Wesley gave away during his lifetime the equivalent of 100,000 English pounds. When Wesley died, he left behind his books, his clergyman gown, a much abused reputation, and the Methodist Church. <laughs> I have shared, shown this before, but this is what I have hanging on my wall in my face. An old plaque that says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. My prayer for you, for me, is when you wake up tomorrow morning, you'll say, Lord, would you bump me into a fish this day that I can share the gospel with? Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, our first question today, what do Methodists believe? Yeah, now I just preached on John Wesley. Here's his diary again. And Wesley, John Wesley in England, 1700s, was the founder of what's called the Methodist Church because they kind of had a method to it. And the Methodist Church has been a very good church mm -hmm. until recently. Sadly, the United Methodist Church, the ELCA Lutheran denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Church of Christ, the Episcopal Church in America, and the Disciples of Christ, these used to be good churches, but they've become radically liberal. And here's what's interesting. The United Methodist Church, they believe in the Trinity, salvation by grace alone, everything we should, mm -hmm. but now they too are promoting the gay stuff mm -hmm. and the universalism that everybody goes to heaven and all this stuff. Now here's what's interesting. The United Methodists have not been able to get practicing homosexual pastors because at their conventions, they let the Methodists from Asia and Africa vote. Mm -hmm. And those Methodists will have nothing to do with that. 
Well, they tried again at their last convention and the liberals lost again. So now the American church, which is very liberal, now there are conservative Methodists, mm -hmm. United Methodists, but by and large, the United Methodist seminaries and hierarchy, hyper-liberal, and now they're going to break in two. And mm -hmm. so the conservative Methodists are gonna have to leave and form their own group. The liberal Methodists, the United Methodist Church, are gonna go ahead now and be like these other denominations, ordain practicing mm -hmm. homosexuals, marry two women. Uh, and so it's very, I will say this, if John Wesley mm -hmm. could see what has become of the Methodist Church, he'd be spinning like mm -hmm. a lathe. If Martin Luther could see the ELCA Lutheran Church, he would weep. Now again, there are good Methodist churches like the Free Methodist Church, the Wesleyan. Uh, there are good Lutheran denominations like the Missouri Synod and the Free Lutherans, etc. But um, you just, just got to be careful when you join a church these mm -hmm. days. It's sad. Maybe. But Methodists, historically, Bible-believing Christians believe in the Trinity, were saved by the cross and not by good works, and all the distinctives of the faith. Okay. Yeah. Did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all start out as fishermen? You know, the story was about the fishing men. Yes. And actually, Matthew was a tax collector. Yeah. John was one of the fishermen talked about in the son of Zebedee. But actually, Mona, Matthew traditionally is the writer of the book of Matthew. He's a, one of the 12. John was one of the 12. Mark was not one of the 12 disciples. His, uh, early history says he was the secretary of Peter. Hmm. So he wrote down Peter's uh, 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 reminiscence. Also then you've got Luke. Luke was not one of the 12. He was a doctor mm -hmm. who accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys. So uh, people think Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the, the, all four of them are, are uh, apostles. No, no. Matthew, tax collector, John, fisherman. But then uh, other, the other 12 disciples, I'd have to study how many of them were fishermen and not, but hmm. there you go. Interesting question. Yeah. What tools do you use to fish for men? All right. Um, first of all, prayer. I pray in the morning, Lord, direct me. Um, I use, I really like tracks. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, you can go to uh, like good news tracks, T R A C T S dot org, mm -hmm. and I encourage everybody, get a bunch of these. Uh, the, the one I use the most is called the Four Spiritual Laws. Um, when I was at that garage sale last week, I handed you know four of them a, a little salvation pamphlet. But you know, get or here's one called Who Is Jesus. Uh, here's one called One Minute After You Die. Mm -hmm. um, or here's one for children how to get to heaven. Or here's a Halloween track that you drop in the in the plate. And here's a Christmas track. So there you go. Well, thank you for joining us today on The Pastor Study. May you have a blessed week, and we'll see you next time on The Pastor Study. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.